century fisherman turned follower turned historian John scribed these words. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord, and he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the others told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I don't recall why Tom wasn't there at that first appearance. Maybe he'd volunteered to go and get some supplies from the market after the Sabbath shutdown was over. Or to let his family know he was safe and we hadn't all been arrested. Or maybe he just needed to get some fresh air after being cooped up in a lock room with ten scared and sweaty friends. Ten very scared, very sweaty friends. No, I don't recall why he wasn't there at that first appearance. Not surprising, you might think, since it's over 50 years since it happened. But I do remember that Tom wasn't there, and I do remember who was there. All ten of us. I was there, my brother Jim. Pete and his brother Andy, Phil, Nate, Matt, Simon, and the other Jim, and Jude, though not the other Jude who had gone, gone over to the enemy and was now, we heard, dead and gone by his own hand. Yes, I remember almost everything that happened in those momentous days with startling clarity as though it were only yesterday. I remember what I saw. I remember what was said. Every word brought to mind with an erring accuracy by the Spirit as the Master had promised. And I remember the smell in that room. The smell of fear, the smell of failure, and especially the smell of death. 
the images of that death were indelibly imprinted on my mind. The one we'd followed for three years. The one who only went about doing good. The one we loved. Nailed to a cross as a common criminal. Hanging in bloody agony in the gathering gloom. On that day we then thought of as Bad Friday. Even to the end, we still hoped that something might happen. A dramatic divine intervention. Or an even more mundane recognition of a terrible miscarriage of justice. Crucified victims had been taken down from the cross and lived, though they were few and far between. But his final cry, finished, was the finish for all of us followed by the thrust of a soldier's spear into his side and the blood and water drenching the ground beneath the cross drowning all our hopes so we went home and we locked the doors fearing that we might be next ten men in a locked room like a funeral without a body Of course, there was a body, but it was in a rock tomb, sealed with a huge stone, guarded by a squadron of Roman soldiers. Or it had been. For this morning, some of our women had discovered the stone rolled away, the soldiers gone. And Pete and I found that the body had gone. One of the women even said that she had seen the Lord, mistaken him for the gardener. More likely mistaken the gardener for him. But none of it made sense as we sat together in that lock room on that Sunday evening until, until, how can you put into words the most incredible, the most unexpected, the most unbelievable? The words I've written here, they hardly seem to do justice to the occasion on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this he showed them his hands and his side not a ghost as we at first feared but a real person one we could not only see but also touch who even took and ate a piece of fish one who was crucified but now was alive how did we feel, you ask? Well, I've tried to put it into writing. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Overjoyed. Echoresen, it's a good Greek word. But no word in any language can fully describe what we felt when we saw the Lord, what I felt when I saw the Lord. And when he spoke again, the same words he had said when he first called us, sending us out as apostles, breathing on us, breathing into us the Holy Spirit. The first glimmerings of understanding began to penetrate our dull minds and our hardened hearts. That his death was not a tragedy, but a triumph. Not an accident, but God's plan. The sacrifice of the Passover lamb pierced for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities bearing absorbing the punishment God's wrath that we deserved and by his wounds we are healed that full understanding came later but at that moment we were simply overwhelmingly overjoyed even when he disappeared as suddenly as he'd come the door still locked ten excited men all talking loudly at the same time until we were frozen into sudden silence by a knock at the door then we breathed a sigh of relief for it was a recognizable knock the one agreed to identify a friend from a foe the door was unlocked and opened and there stood Tom Tom who had not been present 
Poor Tom. Must have been like one of those surprise occasions when all your friends leap out and sing happy birthday. But this was no birthday, but a rebirth day as he was overwhelmed by our cries. We've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. But for Tom, it was no happy rebirth day. Perhaps his reaction was typical of most of us who don't want to admit that we've missed out on good news or to pour cold water on it by suggesting maybe it's not good news after all. But with Tom, with Tom it was more than that. Of all of us, Tom was the realist. The one who dealt in facts, not feelings, expressed in his ultimatum, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand to his side I will not believe it nothing could change his mind or shake him from his skepticism I often think it's a bit unfair that Thomas was forever dubbed as doubting Thomas I suspect that if I hadn't been there at the first appearance I might have been labeled doubting John but it was Thomas who expressed what many of us, most of us, might have felt in the same circumstances. And so, ten delirious disciples, one doubting disciple. We waited for, hoped for, prayed for another appearance. But while others reported sightings and encounters, we saw nothing, we saw no one as hours turned into days and days turned into a week until one day a week to the day in the same place the doors still locked the Lord Jesus appeared among us as before and this time Tom was present and identified by the Lord who addressed him and his doubts directly put your finger here see my hands reach out your hand and put it into my side stop doubting and believe touch wasn't necessary sight was enough as Tom fell to his knees my Lord and my God then the Lord said something to Tom which I didn't really understand at the time because you have seen me you have believed blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed for a few more weeks seeing and believing went together seeing Jesus and believing in him seeing Jesus in a garden on a road in a room, by the sea, individuals, ones and twos, tens and twenties, even on one occasion a crowd of more than 500 people, seeing and believing. But one day, on a hilltop, he disappeared from our sight into the sky, and two men, angelic beings, told us he had been taken up into heaven. They told us there would be no more seeing until the final time, his return from heaven, when every eye on earth would see him. After this, no one saw him again, but many believed in him, hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands throughout the scattered reaches of the Roman Empire and beyond to the ends of the earth people often say to me what a privilege to have seen him face to face what a blessing and I answer blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed but you may ask what is the basis for believing for us who didn't see Jesus the evidence is written evidence, eyewitness evidence. 
The other three presented their evidence, finished their gospels long ago. Young Mark, gleaning the details from Peter, telling his story for Romans of what the true Son of God did as opposed to the pretentious claims of their Caesars. Matthew, with his tax collector's attention to detail, recording the exact words and teaching of Jesus and all the prophecies from the Hebrew Scriptures which he fulfilled to the last letter, proving to his fellow Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. And Dr. Luke, describing to his fellow Greeks what Jesus was like, the Savior of Gentiles as well as Jews, of women as well as men, of sinners as well as saints. Good news of great joy for all people. So now, I'm writing my story. The last of the apostles who were eyewitnesses. All the others have gone. Many following the way of the master, the way of the cross. Thomas, it is rumored, dying in distant India. And as I draw my story to a close, I realize there are many things I still haven't included. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But I have recorded some of the things which the others didn't mention, including the story of Doubting Thomas. For the benefit of every Doubting Thomas to come, every Doubting John, every doubting Peter, every doubting Mary, every doubting Hamish, every doubting Morag, every doubting Donald. You, who on an occasion like this, on another Easter Sunday evening, feel like Thomas, that you've missed out, while the rest joyfully sing, the Lord is risen. I've included reliable eyewitness evidence so that you who didn't see might believe in Jesus and believing in him, putting your trust in him, might receive from Jesus the life for which he died and rose again, the life you were made for, the life that even death cannot destroy. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Well, that's my story finished. Well, almost. I'm going to add an epilogue, the account of a final encounter with the risen Jesus. You'll find my full story in the Bible, under the Gospel according to John. Read and believe. Believe and receive. Believe it or not. <laughs>